Well, first of all, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that people model behavior that they see around them. Mm -hmm. So what we noticed was a rising popularity in reality TV as a specific genre of television and also the use of social media tools, and in this case, social networking sites like Facebook. So the behavior that's modeled on programs uh, like American Idol, for example, is such that people are rewarded for being celebrities. So what we're finding is that young people now have the tools at their disposal for little to no cost to, to pursue that goal, to in, in essence model that behavior. Yeah, and one of the, one of the kind of the interesting aspects of this um, uh, celebrity culture that we see, are seeing is that uh, participants in reality TV shows, for example, are regular people or they're purported to be regular people. Mm -hmm. And they suddenly have this ability to become world famous for doing nothing other than uh, being regular, for being uh, publicized. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, change of pace. And that's something that uh, we think can be reflected in this uh, you know, mm -hmm. social media uh, Web 2.0 environment. OK, so we sampled uh, almost 470 students from two universities and they completed a survey where they self-report on their media diet, traditional media diet, in terms of television viewing. So we had reality television, news, entertainment, educational programming, etc. And then we had their new media diet. So how often were they online maintaining their Facebook profiles? Uh, what was the size of their network? And most importantly, what proportion of the network have they never met? And this is what we're operationalizing as promiscuous friending. Mm. I was trying to think of how, how we came up with that. Uh, no, it's it really just, just this interesting idea. There's been a lot of discussion uh, you know, amongst you know, scholars and others about this uh, changing, changing ways that people are using social networking sites. Right. So where they, they were never initially about friendship in the sense of... Yeah. of, uh, of you know, offline friendship. It was always something a little bit different. Right. And one of the things that was most interesting were these, uh, the accumulation of people in your network who you maybe didn't know in, yeah. in some sense. And so, you know, promiscuity means uh, uh, maybe a lack of, lack of discretion or a, a lack of uh, intense involvement. Right. And so this is promiscuous uh, behavior. Culturally, we're shifting to to this emphasis on celebrity, as we've been talking about, as, mm -hmm. as a really positive thing. When in fact, celebrities are subject to all kinds of pressures. And if you look at the frequency at which they have, for example, substance abuse problems, um, and it's all, this is all manifesting in, in the public eye, as it were. I mean, there's, there's immense pressure associated with being seen. Mm -hmm. uh, further than that, the more information people know about you, I would argue, the more restricted you are in your behavior. So we all engage in face work all the time, right? We, we present ourselves in line with what we view others' expectations of us are. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that, that's, a, that's an important point because that, that flexibility in how you present yourself uh, translates into a wide range of opportunities in terms of what you can do, right, in terms of your behavior. But now we're seeing that people's identity is becoming constant across all of their social situations. So in essence, you're, you're restricting yourself to uh, a much more limited set of behavior right. options, I would say. Sure, and I think, I think anyone who has participated on a social networking site has you know, run into this issue about, well, I have you know, this, this set of 150 people who I know, mm -hmm. and offline I know them in several different contexts. You know, I know them as my, my work colleagues and my family and my, my high school friends and my college friends. And to have, uh, you know, be presenting the same, the same profile, so to, so to speak, the same face to all those friends, yeah, it requires you to really think about uh, this identity that you're projecting. And that's something that, um, that we kind of argue that's, that's relatively new. That's something that celebrities have maybe had to think about a lot in the past. But this uh, distinction between the celebrity world and, you know, the world that we, we occupy mm -hmm. is, uh, 
you know, be, maybe being a little, eroded a little bit, where we mm. have to concentrate on these mediated identities. That we maintain. The game metaphor is, is apt, I think, because, you know, people haven't changed. You know, I, I try to stress this all of the time. People have the same motivations. Uh, they have the same fears and anxieties that they had, you know, hundreds of years before the Internet came about. So one of the ways to think about this behavior is the pursuit of attention, right, where attention is power. And human beings being, being social mm -hmm. beings, some level of attention is, is a necessity. And there's a point of diminishing returns, of course, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's, that's a good metaphor. What are the consequences of spending a significant amount of your cognitive resources competing for attention on a platform like this? Um, I think it's most relevant in the context of, say, freshmen coming to a university where they're leaving uh, an existing social support network behind, right, if they're, if they're traveling for, for university studies. They leave that network behind, so they've got this remote social support network, and then, in theory, you're supposed to develop a, a much more localized set of close friends that are very important in terms of social support for, for situations, uh, you know, emotionally traumatic situations, like, like a transition to a new, new environment, uh, such as a mm -hmm. typical freshman might face. So, so in that case, uh, one of the things to look at would be, are there negative consequences for, for investing so much time and so much energy into maintaining networks like these? He's always used this metaphor of displacement. So when video game consoles came out for the home, they displaced what kids used to do, and that was go to arcades to play video games, right? So now the one worry might be that if students are investing significant amounts of time and energy into maintaining their pseudo-celebrity status or their social network profile, then presumably they're spending less time studying, right? It's interesting to, uh, to think about, again, these, these life transitions that we typically go through. So I think high school to college is maybe a good example where, you know, the at least when I went to, to college, you know, you had the opportunity to kind of, you know, reinvent yourself because you were in a new social context. You had uh, spent these 18 years developing this one particular identity and suddenly you were separated from that context and you had the ability to kind of experiment and uh, uh, explore your own identity a little bit more. Mm. And what something like Facebook does is that forces you to kind of maintain this, uh, this social context for much longer. Mm. And so it's interesting when you you kind of see that, you know, I never really leave this set of the social context behind. It just has to kind of be uh, merged into my, my new social context. Mm. So, that's, so that's kind of an interesting area, too. Yeah, this is, this is an important point because 20 years ago we would have characterized the Internet as a relatively cold and hostile place. But that's because people's online identities, their mediated identities, weren't tied to their offline selves. But that's the real big change now. Given the, the transition in, in people's role as media producers rather than just strictly consumers these days we're finding that these online identities are closely tied to your offline persona it's not necessarily uh, beneficial or destructive but it's certainly different and that mm -hmm. i mean you look at a lot of the commentary about the internet in the uh, 90s and a lot of that rhetoric was about how we were suddenly freed from all the constraints of our bodies you know so it, it didn't matter if you were a man or a woman or your race or what you looked like because you were just words and so it was uh, supposed to be kind of this uh, meritocratic uh, anarchy or democracy where all that really mattered was your ability to express yourself in language but uh, what we're seeing now is kind of a return back to uh, the importance of the physical body and right. return back to appearance and so it's rather than um, Again, breaking away from whatever uh, physical <clears throat> physical identity you have, it seems to be coming coming back, back to it. In terms of next steps, uh, and, and the answer is, you know, what are the consequences? A good answer is always that it depends. So, are there positive outcomes associated with using this technology? Well, you could in, you can envision a study where you might look at, say, a university student's performance over time and then control for how much time and energy they're investing. Because ultimately the, these networks, you know, social networks, represent opportunity. So in this case, opportunity for social support and a variety of other resources. But it's important, of course, to, to have friends around you. 
But I can imagine a, a different scenario where a student travels abroad and leaves behind a network of close friends and family, a, a social support network, and then this technology affords them great ease to, to, to use, to rely on this remote network for, for support instead of developing a, a local network of, of close ties. And there's a lot of evidence that would suggest in, in organizational communication literature, for example, that people that end up on a periphery of a network and that aren't successful at, at assimilation, uh, they don't last long.